Hello and welcome to the Monday, July 8th, 2024 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Well, after taking a break for a week, there is some catching up to do with some vulnerabilities that came up during last week's holiday week. So let's start with the regression vulnerability where SS. H is sort of here used instead of just an S for regression. It's a remote code execution vulnerability in the very popular OpenSSH server. And then, of course, made it a big deal. However, looking at it closer, exploitation is actually a little bit tricky for this vulnerability. It does require many, many attempts to eventually be successful and likely is really only exploitable in a semi-realistic fashion on x86, so on 32-bit architectures, not really on 64-bit architectures. Now, the reason for the unreliability of the exploit is that it's really a race condition. When you're connecting to an open SSH server, there is a login grace time, uh, typically 120 seconds, uh, but that's adjustable and depends a little bit on your Linux distribution, what uh, may be set here. If the timeout expires before the login completed, then there is a signal handler being called that calls other code that is not signal safe, which then can lead to the remote code execution. Interestingly, this vulnerability has been fixed before. In 2006, a CVE was published that affected OpenSSH before version 4.4 patch level 1. Then the same vulnerability was reintroduced in 8.5 patch level 1. So that was about four years ago where this vulnerability was reintroduced. To be exploitable, you need OpenSSH then to call these async signal unsafe functions, and that happens if your Linux system is glibc based, which most of the large systems are. OpenBSD, while it's using uh, the uh, OpenSSH code, is not vulnerable here in this case. So overall, this is not a huge emergency, but something that you probably should address by simply applying available uh, patches. It's always a good idea to limit access uh, to your SSH daemon via various network controls, may this be rate limiting or limiting access to particular IP addresses to just uh, reduce your attack surface. You could also increase uh, the login grace time to infinite, uh, which basically means you just set it to zero in the configuration file. However, that opens yourself up to potential denial of service attacks. From a detection point of view, you should see a number of different failed logins. So if you see lots and lots of failed logins in an SSH server, this may be an indicator that you are subject to this attack. I say maybe because if you have an open exposed uh, SSH server, you probably already see a bunch of uh, failed login attempts. That's just that comes with the territory, given how big of a target uh, these SH servers are just for simple password brute forcing. Then we got another interesting sort of holiday issue, and that was routing issues around Hurricane Electric. If you're not familiar with Hurricane Electric, don't get deceived by their very simple web page. It's one of the important companies when it comes to route internet traffic. Lots of good work here from Hurricane Electric for IPv6 and other sort of topics around routing and the internet in particular. Well, uh, one issue they had is that their domain, he.net, was all for sudden no longer reachable on July 4th. As any domain, he.net 
is registered with a domain name Registra. And the one that Hurricane Electric picked here is Network Solutions, one of sort of the OGs when it comes uh, to network registrars. But Network Solutions did set the status for the he.net domain in client hold. Client hold is often used to essentially remove temporarily a domain from the internet, often for legal issues and things like non-payment or such. So it's not that the domain expired, that someone forgot to renew it or anything uh, like that. Apparently, what happened was that a Network Solution received a phishing report implicating he.net. Now, personally, I think it's a little bit surprising that for one simple phishing report, they're outright sort of you know, withdrawing uh, the he.net domain name. But... I haven't really dealt with network solutions in quite a while, so not really sure what their internal processes are here. The problem here was because he.net is an IP transit provider, so a lot of ISPs are routing traffic via he.net. Any router name that used the he.net domain name now no longer resolved. It's unclear uh, what exactly happened here with the phishing. According to he.net, uh, the supposed phishing page was not a phishing page, just a page that had some customer logos or such on it. Uh, I believe that. I don't know what the exact uh, page was, but uh, quite often in sort of you know trying to triage phishing pages, it's easy to mistake a legitimate page for a phishing page, which is why usually a provider like Network Solution probably should check back with Hurricane Electric uh, before they're taking these drastic actions uh, to remove the domain name over a single complaint. For me, one of the lessons learned here is that you make sure that you do have communication channels with your registra. Make sure that any email address they have for you is actually uh, monitored in case there are complaints coming in so you're able uh, to respond. Also, maybe time to rethink some of the privacy guards for who is information. It can be quite helpful for someone who legitimately would like to report a problem like a phishing site or such uh, for your domain if they have good contact information in who is and uh, for a commercial domain that's assigned to your company it's probably a good idea anyway to have your company's information being published in who is and there's sort of at least from my point of view little uh, downside uh, if uh, you are making some contact information uh, public here I'll leave this a little bit up to you. I do use these privacy services a lot uh, because it's sort of now the default for a lot of registrars. But uh, it would be interesting to hear uh, what you think about this. And well, if DNS is not the problem, it's usually a BGP. And uh, just before last week, uh, Cloudflare had an incident where its uh, 1111 uh, DNS server uh, was not reachable, at least for parts of uh, the internet. The problem here was, as has happened in the past, a malicious or accidental BGP hijack where some ISP did publish the 1.1.1.1 slash 32 route as being directed to themselves, which then, of course, caused the disruption. The disruption here didn't actually lead sort of to uh, the machine in the middle attack where traffic was then necessarily rerouted to that network, but apparently some ISPs did interpret this as a request to just block access to this IP address. Uh, these very specific uh, routes for one IP address are often used that way, and uh, that then essentially led to a denial of service. Well, uh, you always should have more than one uh, DNS server as sort of your recursive uh, forwarding servers, if possible, with multiple providers. So like your Google, your Cloudflare, or OpenDNS, whoever you trust in order to get some resiliency. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for listening and thanks for anybody subscribing or liking or just leaving a good comment for this podcast. Tomorrow, we'll be back sort of to our more normal program with patches and the like.